Hello, my name is Roller Angel. I'm really happy to be presenting at this year's BSD Can. Um, talking about using Ansible playbooks to automate the deployment of various services on FreeBSD. Um, I've been using Ansible a lot on FreeBSD to automate different things and keep track of my projects as they get larger and larger. So uh, I just wanted to show in this talk how you can utilize these services on FreeBSD and I'm using I took some of the services I have around around the house like the the router over there and um, where is the router I hear the router and uh, that's running FreeBSD so I thought I would give a, a an example of how you can set up a router with a simple PF configuration and then also about deploying a Python uh, fast API application that's using Postgres and it'll use, use Nginx and Let's Encrypt and it'll show you how how just changing a couple variables in a file you can have this whole thing up and running and ready to go um, and it, it makes it exciting because then next time you go to do one of these uh, um, services that, that you want to run on a new machine you don't have to go back to your documentation or start from scratch. You can just run your play, Ansible playbook and have your machine set up how you expect. Hello, it's Roller Angel. Thanks for having me at BSD Can. Uh, this is using Ansible playbooks to automate the deployment of various services on FreeBSD. And so, what we're going to cover is, you know, what is Ansible? How do how does one install Ansible? And what are some of the things that make up an Ansible um, playbook? Um, so all these different things are going to go into a, an Ansible playbook. Modules, tasks, templates, roles, plugins, variables. Uh, then we're going to automate a router uh, deployment with Ansible. Um, that's going to offer various services um, like NTP, DNS, uh, DHCP. Uh, then we're going to check out automating a web app. This is going to be a Python web application with fast API, uh, PostgreSQL, Nginx, and that'll be fun. And then we'll, while we're um, showing you these deployments, we're, we'll dive deeper into the modules. Some of the modules will cover like synchronize, file, line and file, block and file, shell, command, service, package, get, copy, and more. Um, yeah, so let's get going. Um, how do we set up Ansible and what is it? So Ansible is a configuration management software. Uh, it allows you to have clientless execution, uh, meaning all you need is SSH set up on your systems that you want to control and automate. And Ansible can just use SSH to connect to that machine and then start issuing it commands. Uh, typically it's the modules that Ansible uses to to do different tasks on a machine are written in Python so it'll make sure that you have Python installed and um, yeah so people usually use Ansible to to manage either large number of changes on their on their network if they're responsible for many different machines. Um, you can install software, you can get information from systems, and you can do this in parallel. So uh, you, you can have Ansible contact many systems at the same time to get the information and speed up your administration tasks. Um, it's also good for documentation uh, because it shows every step that you're taking in, in, in your playbook. and. Uh, if you forget how you did something down the road, you, you, not only do you have a playbook, you could just run it again automated, but it's good to look in there and, and see um, why you did things a certain way or, or how you pulled it off. Um, so we're going we're gonna to talk about uh, requirements. Like, So what would you need for Ansible? So to set it up, um, we're going to install... Uh, if you just search Ansible in, in the FreeBSD packages, you'll see pi38-ansible is there. So we're going to install that. 
and then uh, Py 3.8 net adder. This is a Python uh, thing that's going to do some when we make our router, we're going to want to manipulate some IP addresses, and that package has some cool um, functionality that we're going to utilize um, as an Ansible plugin uh, later on. So what I did on my machine was just ran those commands, and so if I um, Yeah, it shows that, uh, I should have said package info, my bad. But um, anyways, it'll show, you know, this was installed and um, it's good to go. So what we can do, um, we can do Ansible version to make sure that we have it. And it looks like, yes, it's definitely installed. And so what I was thinking was you, you, you can do um, different configurations in Ansible as long as you already have SSH set up on, on a machine. And um, so rather than start off with, with the SSH setup, I can show you that uh, in here in a few when we get to the web app. But for now, I thought we could just start with the router. And I have a, um, a router running on a um, computer uh, inside a virtual machine. So I have a router on, on the virtual machine and I have the guest as another virtual machine. And they're going to be connected via the LAN, they're gonna be connected directly, and the, the guest later on, um, just so that we can still get to it we're gonna um, come in through this red line here to the guest, uh, and, and I'll explain that here in a second. Um, if you look at the VM setup here, you'll see um, the router VM has three adapters. So I'm using adapter one is the bridge adapter, and that's just getting an IP address from my, my local uh, LAN here at the house. Um, the adapter two is a NAT network, and then uh, adapter three is an internal network. And then these second arguments are just the names of those networks. And for the NAT network, it simply just requires a name. You can put the CIDR in there if you want to, but um, just make sure you uncheck supports DHCP because we're not even gonna use that, uh, those specific settings. You don't have to use those specific settings. Um, the NAT network is just a way of if one machine says it's hooked to the NAT network of that name and the other one says it's hooked to the NAT network of that name, it's just like creating uh, these, these lines that, that we created here um, so that you see that these are on the same uh, network. Um, that This would be the NAT network is this LAN thing. Um, so the... Uh, the internal network, I was just showing that there's two ways you can directly connect a machine. You can do it, uh, either of these connection types in VirtualBox will work. The internal network, it just requires a name, so I just called it on Home Lab. But um, yeah, uh, I just thought I'd show you the, the couple different ways that we can connect computers together and in a, in a virtual lab. So we can set up a router and then we can have a client uh, internal guest inside of that LAN use the router to get out to the internet. Um, the uh, the internal guest isn't going to have initially it's not going to have this this direct line out to the internet. It's going to have to go. Uh, it's initially we're going to just have it go through the LAN to the router. Uh, the router is going to give it its DNS and 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 uh, DHCP settings and everything. And then it'll it'll forward everything over to the internet. Um, this one is set up pretty much the same way. It's just um, once the router's configured and set up, SSH is turned off. So there's no more way to get um, SSH back into the router unless you're on this um, uh, side of the fence, basically. You're not gonna be able to come in through the internet to SSH into the router. So we enabled um, 
SSH over here on the, on the secondary line. So if you're connected to this internal network, then you can SSH and, you know, update and manage the router and everything. Um, but over the LAN, you're not going to be able to SSH to the router. Uh, and then since I wanted to be able to show you this, um, since my uh, system that's hosting these VMs is not, um, it's actually on my local, um, technically this, this would be like, um, the internet would actually be out there. And this is like my local, um, you know, house LAN basically. And um, so my house LAN is actually what I'm connecting directly to from here. And then that's going to give me a bridged, uh, a, uh, a bridged um, connection from here to there. That's what VirtualBox will do for me. Um, so this is bridged adapter, this is internal adapter, and this one is a NAT network. And we could have used NAT network for this one or internal adapter for this one. It wouldn't have mattered. But I just thought I'd show you two different ways. Okay, so how, how does this look in Ansible code? Um, so what it would look like is, let's come over here to this router and I'll just type tree here. That way I can give you an initial view of how I like to do my Ansible playbooks. There are multiple ways of doing Ansible playbooks and, and I decided to just show you how I do my Ansible playbooks. And um, basically I do this folder structure. So each of these lines over here, you're seeing a folder and then it ends, this is a file. So there's a folder called group virus, a folder called all, and a file called config. And then there's this ansible.cfg. So let's take a look at um, both of those. So cat ansible. This will just tell you where the host file is, which is right here. And it's going to say what version of Python we want. And you'll notice that we have these double curly with the word Python version in there. That'll come in handy here in a minute. And then remote user is what, what user do we use to SSH into a machine? And I'm just saying roller there. And um, so now let's look at where's this Python version coming from? So that was that group vars. So cat group vars all config. And you'll see inside of here, we have a Python version. And we're using a string of 3.9. So that'll just, whenever uh, Ansible is running, this will just be replaced directly with 3.9. So that'll do the right Python, and you only have to update it in that one spot. Um, what we're going to be doing inside the router, some of these other um, uh, variables that we're going to be pulling in is a router host name. So I'm just going to call it gateway. Uh, the router domain name, which I'm going to call lab.bsd.pw, and then the router's fully qualified domain name. And... Um, I could have just typed a uh, um, router host name right there, the dot, and then router domain name. But oh well. Um, <laughs> basically, you can reuse. Um, you don't have to, but you can reuse your variables. So I could have just said router host name dot router domain name, which was what I should have did. Um, um, and typically, when you're using double variables in a, uh, a value, you want to put these uh, quotes around it. Um, just because if it's something a little more complicated, then then just a, uh, then you should just put it in quotes if you're not sure. So we can always um, them that. So here's how you would. Um, put in place a, um, a host name. Um, so if I wanted to do that here, I could just say uh, use that instead. And then um, you're going to want to put these uh, these uh, quotes around the whole thing just so it, it, it for sure puts that all together and makes it work right. Um, yeah, so anyways, the router host name and then the domain name. 
um, the upstream the upstream network interface driver name. So in FreeBSD, there's a driver name followed by a number for whatever driver you're using for your interface. Um, in VirtualBox, I'm using the Intel one, so it's EM and zero for the first one. That's the that's the um, the bridged interface that gives us our connection out to the internet. Then the LAN, and this one is EM1. And the LAN IP, I'm going to have be 192.168.1.1. Here's the LAN net mask. And then I want to have a format of, of I, I want to have the IP slash net mask as a variable. So I'm, I'm pulling that in right here. I'm just saying, give me the LAN IP slash, give me the LAN net mask and call that LAN IP slash net mask. And then um, I'm saying, what, what's the lower DHCP range? Sometimes people want to leave a couple machines at the beginning. Uh, if you do, then just change that number here. And then to get the end of the range, um, you can actually just use this LAN IP slash net mask and pipe that into IP adder. This was what that net, net adder thing, um, when we did the install, this is where that comes in is it gives you these cool manipulation tools so you can actually just call this and say um, what's the last usable and that'll that'll give you the last usable address in that network and then uh, I wanted the first two octets so 192.168 as a variable so this is just a way that you can grab the IP address split it split up all the numbers into a list take the two the first two out of the list and put them together with a dot in between. So you'll get 192, 168, and then they'll be connected with a dot. And we call that LAN first two octets. And the SSH network interface, this is the one that's set up pretty much the same way, except in our firewall rules, we're gonna say only SSH to, uh, from, to this network, no SSH on, on these other two networks. Um, okay. So that's, um, oh, let's right quit that. So let's do a tree again. And now we're, we're, we're moving a little bit further down. Let's look at this host file. So what's in a host file? Um, in a host file, you have the IP address or the domain name of the machine that you want to connect to. So. Um, the IP address of my virtual machine on my network over here is um, 10.16.28.53. And that's how we're going to be connecting to the machine. And so that's just what a host file is. It groups these into a common and a router. And then if you'll notice up here, I have common and router. So that will connect, you know, all the machines that belong to common and the different tasks that I'm going to be asking it to do, those all need to go uh, to that machine. And if it's the same machine, you could just put the number again. Um, one machine can be part of multiple groups. That's not a problem. Um, so let's go ahead and look at um, uh, roles. So we have roles. Um, well, I, uh, let's just do playbook first since that's the next one on the list. So playbook, what does playbook look like? The playbook is saying, um, it has a name. So I'm just saying it's supplying the configuration for the servers listed in the host. And hosts here says all hosts. So it's, it's gonna do everything. And the roles that I'm looking at are common and router. Um, so that's, that's really just gonna go into these different directories and start, um, seeing if there's any tasks that are included and then it'll, it'll do the tasks. Um, tasks have interfaces to templates and they have interfaces to handlers. So um, this gather facts false. Um, if you, you can do a lot with gather facts, but if you're not using it to gather specific facts about a machine and then doing something based off of the facts that you get, um, if you're not actually using it, then there's no need to, um, to, uh, have it, it's by default it's set to true. So 
the reason why I changed that is because if if I was to leave it on uh, true, then it would just take extra time looking up some facts about a machine every time. And um, I don't need to do that. Uh, since I'm not using it, it would just slow down everything. Um, so let's, let's check out roles next. So we'll do roles, common, uh, tasks. Like we said, task was the main interface and then main. So let's see what's that, what's in there. Um, so main is going to include other, those other files. And if you look, what's, what, what are the other files? We had bootstrap, freebsd update, Python config, SSH config. So these are our configuration files for those different, uh, sets of Ansible, uh, modules and tasks. So I'm using this import tasks statement to statically import. Um, we're starting with bootstrap. Um, I, I commented out FreeBSD update um, just so we don't have to wait for the update to take place um, during this presentation, but I would normally run that. And then um, the Python config and the SSH config. So let's start taking a look at some of those. So if I look at um, uh, Bootstrap, Well, I guess we can look at it Vim. It'll probably look a little nicer. So bootstrap, it's going to do a sudo package install dash y using the raw module. So it's literally just going to type this into the, the, the SSH connection. And it's going to say, I want to install Python and then it's going to get the version number. And in the, in the packages, there's no dot. So this one's taking them, splitting it up and then joining them together with no dot. So it'll just say Python 3.9, no dot, and then that'll become yes, just means do you want to um, give it the the pseudo password and, and become this super user? So that's where we're putting become yes there, and then changed when false. Usually with these raw commands, it's not going to have a, a success or fail report, um, which I'll show you uh, later what that is, but basically it'll... If you do change when false, then you can just say, hey, this specific module is not going to react how, just pretend like it, it, it worked and um, we'll move on. So um, that's just a one way to deal with that situation where you're using some module that doesn't support reporting whether or not it's done a task. Um, so let's see what else. So um, FreeBSD update was going to be the next one. This one's just running a module called shell and that shell there's one called shell and there's one called a command um, shell lets you use um, things like the double ampersand to do multiple commands and uh, the command doesn't commit commands let you run commands shell lets you run things that you would normally run in the shell so if you want to update FreeBSD and all the packages. If you're just using packages, then this is just a quick one, one liner that'll do those three things and get your system up to date. Um, next, we're going to look at, we had a, a Python config and this one, um, not, not strictly necessary. Um, I typically just run these on my FreeBSD machines with Python because it'll make sure you have the latest pip and it'll make sure it's all up upgraded. Um, then SSH. Um, usually I'm just coming in here to see if by chance if the sshd config has permit, permit root login uh, enabled. If it does, then we'll just say no. Uh, permit root, root login will just replace that with no. So this is regular expression searching for something that starts with permit root login without password. And if it finds it, it'll replace that line with permit root login. No, uh, backup. No means it's not going to create a backup file and become yes means it has the pseudo privilege to edit that file and notify. This is an interesting one. So notify restart SSH. So what that's going to do, um, if you notice, we were in common and we were in tasks and the SSH one was going to do a notify um, of this restart SSH, right? 
So what that'll do is that'll come up into the handlers, and if there's any handlers included, it'll see if they have a listen task, and if they do, the listen task will get executed. So let's go see what the listen task looks like. So, um, so in here we we have this at the very bottom of of this one. It says listen restart SSH. So if, it, if there was a notify triggered, then this listen will, will also get triggered. And so what's this one doing? It's a service module, and the service module takes the name of the service. So we want SSHD, and what do you want? What state do you want it to be in? I want it to be restarted, and be super user yes, and that's it there. Okay, and then um, the main file looks pretty much the same as the other main files. You just use them to include uh, tasks. Uh, that way, you can split things up. Um, which I'll be showing you in this next section. So, um, that was all the common stuff. Uh, now let's look at the router tasks. And um, you'll see in the router, I have templates as well as handlers. So in templates, um, we're doing something interesting. Uh, I'll show you what, what we're doing. So if I, roles router templates and I look at let's do a dhcpd.conf you're going to see that I'm able to take a template of, of a configuration file like dhcpd.conf this is this is the configuration file for setting up your own dhcp daemon and usually you'd have to put a bunch of the numbers in here well we're getting all these from the variables so we're saying um, you know advertise this domain name so we're just putting in their router domain name so for my case that was lab.bsd.pw that so that'll just go in there and then the subnet it's going to do lan ip slash net mask and then pipe into this ip adder and it's going to give me the network so that'll give me like the 192.168.1.0 and then the net mask and then that's just lan net mask so that'll switch those out and then um, you're going to include a range so this is where you would put the lower DHCP range number and this is where you would put the upper DHCP range uh, number and then the option routers that's just going to be the LAN's IP address and the option domain name server is also going to be LAN's IP address and then this is all the same down here for um, the SSH IP as well All right, so that's one file. Um, another template was uh, pf.conf. So this is the firewall, and you can just include this whole firewall file here, and it's going to just do the same thing. It's gonna look for all the different variables and swap those out with whatever the value in the variable was before it puts this file onto the remote machine. So that makes it really nice. You can just say, you know, I want to need the upstream, the upstream driver name, which was the EM0, the LAN driver name, which was EM1, the SSH interface driver name, which was EM2. It will pull all those in together and, uh, you know, redirect the, the traffic to, uh, you know, it, this last one's going to allow SSH uh, uh, to go into this one network. And the, yeah, this is a pretty straightforward uh, configuration for just moving some packets around um, to be perform some basic routing tests. And these are the different services um, for your DNS, DHCP, and NTP. Um, so we're going to get out of there. And one last file was uh, rc.com. This is where we're going to be configuring a lot of the router, like, uh, you know, a few flags and, and some services to turn off. And what's the fully qualified domain name? We'll set that as the host name for the machine. Um, then we're going to use the if config commands to set up the networking. So 
This will just be replaced with EM0 is going to be DHCP. Uh, EM1 is going to be the IP address for the LAN and the LAN's netmask. EM2 is going to be the IP address for SSH and the SSH netmask. And then we're enabling SSH so that we can run Ansible to control this machine. Um, we're doing the NTP and we're, you know, PFs enabled, gateways enabled. These are going to help run our services. And so we're going to get out of here now. So now we're looking at, you've seen what the templates do. So now let's look at um, what did we do in these uh, in this main uh, file here. So roles router tasks main. So in here we're just including all the tasks in firewall first, and then we're going to do all the tasks in services and startup second. So let's look at. Um, look at firewall. So firewall is very simple. It's just uh, using this module called template. And template takes a source. So pf.conf is, is what I called it in my templates directory. So that's what it's going to look for. And the destination on the remote machine is etsy pf.conf. And I want to become root. Yes. Um, next we had services and startup. So this one you're going to install the pa the packages that you need for your router. So use the package module. And if you want to give it multiple packages, and instead of just giving it one, then you put in quotes um, this temporary variable called item. And then that corresponds to this with items. But I'll, I'll skip that for a sec while I tell you about um, state present. So state present installs, state absent uninstalls. So we'll just use present here because we want to install packages and the with item says what packages. Um, so we're saying DJB DNS for our DNS and ISC DHCP server for our DHCP server. And we need to become uh, root so we need to have pseudo privilege so that we can do that install. And then um, Here's the uh, router startup configuration file. So this is the template. It's going to look for rc.conf in the templates folder, and it's going to place that on the remote machine in etsy rc.conf. Then it's going to do the DHCP. So same thing. It's going to go in the template folder. It's going to fill out all the variables that we had in this dhcpd.conf, all those IP addresses and everything. It's going to plug all those in, and it's going to save the file in user local etsy dhcpd.conf. Next, we need to set up a DNS cache user. So we're using the user module. And the name of the user is DNS cache. We can set a user ID and a home folder and a shell. And um, we didn't want them to have a home folder or a shell. So th those are the settings we used. And become yes. That makes it uh, like sudo, like running sudo. Um, PW add user or something like that. So um, DNS. Log user, same thing. We're just making another user, but this one's called DNS log. And then uh, we need a, a directory created, uh, slash var, slash service. So um, what we do is we use the file module, tell the path, uh, and then we say what the state is going to be directory. And that'll actually just do like a, it'll create a directory there, and it'll make sure that if it's already there, it won't create it again. If it if it needs to be created, and then it'll create it. Um, that's just a concept called uh, item potence, and that's one of the benefits you get of using Ansible uh, modules. Is you're going to start to have uh, the same results regardless of whether you run this operation multiple times. Um, so. Things like creating a directory, and it, it, it'll check to see if it exists first before creating it without you having to write any special code to do that. Um, it'll you know check to see if this user exists before creating it. Those types of things. Um, it makes it nice. Um, 
uh, helps you keep track of, of the state of the machine. And, and you know that your machine's always in the right state when you use these um, idempotent commands. Um, but you can always start with, with things like command and move into other modules once you, if you find a module that, that, that fits. But sometimes you just need to run a command, like this one, DNS cache config setup. So I'm running a command, and there's a binary called DNS cache-conf. And here's the the users I'm giving it, um, the the where I want it to go, and some some options for it. And then this one's going to notify restart router. Um, so that will that'll go to the handler. It'll look for a listen of restart router, and it'll run that command. Um, then it's just whenever you do these notifies, they um, they queue up to run and they wait until all the tasks have finished running and then they'll and then they'll go through and they'll do their uh the notifies will all fire off and they'll do all their little uh, handler tasks at the end so the router's not going to restart at this point it's going to keep be ready to restart after it's done running all these so then it's gonna um this one is a file with the state of touch so that's just going to create a file, um, an empty file, and update the date on that file. So it's just going to put it here in root IP, and then that's why I need the LAN first two octets, because um, that's just how you set up the DNS cache. Um, so if if you kept the, the IP addresses that I was using for SSH, then this second command will just touch the same file as this one, the 192.168. But if you've, you know, modify those numbers, then you're going to need, you know, if, if, if the SSH and the LAN don't have the same first two octets, then this will take care of that. So that's, that's why I did that. Um, anyway, so after that's done running, then um, it's going to run that handler uh, restart router. So let's look at that one. Um, so we have roll router handler uh, restart router and this one is there is a reboot module but like the, it, it's item potent and meaning it's going to try and check to see if it's successful or not so it knows if it's already rebooted the machine or not and um, with our firewall if you remember it's um, once it's once it's finished being set up, there is no more SSH coming coming in from the LAN or or anywhere. You're you're not coming into the router anymore via SSH. You'd you'd only be able to do that from the internal um, on this specific um, internal network, which is on a different network card. So in order to uh, deal with that scenario. Um, we're doing this. So we're rebooting the router and we're just calling the command init six. Um, we could have also used the command shut down minus R now. Um, both of those will work just fine. And that'll reboot the router. The router will come back up and it'll be serving all the services to any clients. So um, I have created a, a client machine that, that we can um, log into after uh, have this router running so that we can test it out. So what we do is we say Ansible playbook dash VV. Um, that's going to give us some extra verbosity. It'll tell us a little bit more about what it's doing while it's doing it. Uh, and then we just want to run playbook.yaml. And let's see what that does. Yeah, that's bootstrapping Python, which was that raw module that we saw. Um, and the way that it was able to connect directly to the machine, I have my key file in my SSH agent, which I'll show you that here in a minute. Um, and now it's just going through the different common tasks in order. The upgrade, the disable root SSH logins, installing all the different packages, 
okay, everything's done, and reboot the router was called, and if I look over on my VirtualBox machine, the router's definitely rebooting right now. And um, so now I'm going to turn on my internal guest on my on my um, router on my router's LAN. I have another machine that's gonna we're gonna use to check. But um, basically, if I wanted to connect to this machine again now, uh, for, first I'll show you what. Um, uh, So these are the commands that I have as aliases. I have SSH agent, and then my shell, which I use as TCSH, and then SSH-add, and I give it my key file. And once you type in your your key, um, your passphrase to unlock your key, then it just goes into your, um, your SSH agent. So when you're doing SSH stuff, if your key's already there and that key can connect to the server, then it won't ask you for your password or anything like that. I'll just connect like it's supposed to. But if we wanted to connect, like, and we want to connect to this address now, we're going to notice um, the machine is booted up, but the firewall is no longer allowing the SSH from this LAN network to come in anymore. Um, But if I come into my other computer, it looks like it's got an IP address of 54. Okay, so let's take a look. This is the computer that's on the, um, the internal guest. It's got three different network connections. Um, it doesn't need these two uh, at the moment, you know, to prove the point that, that the internet's working you would have those two interfaces down and you would just make sure it runs through this one. But I wouldn't be able to connect to this machine from this this previous DB machine on my LAN unless I had this uh, this bridge network interface coming in. And then also I wanted to show you how to SSH back to the router too. So I have all, if we look, I have all three EM0, EM1, and EM2 are all um, active and up. And so if you look at EM0, that's the 192.168.1.2. So that got an, that got the uh, the LAN address from the router and it's it's able to uh, connect to the internet just through that. Um, this one was a, a direct connection that I was bridging because I wanted to be able to come in from from this record um, previous D box, and then uh, this guy is that um, I'll show you. So if I wanted to get into the router now, I can go in through 192.168.2.1. This is the SSH way in, and um, you'll notice it's going to ask me what's my passphrase um, for that because I didn't do the SSH agent. And here we go. Now I'm in the gateway. And if we look at how the gateway is set up, the gateway's EM0 has the, the, this would be your public IP address, basically. It gets it from upstream DHCP. So that's usually how it would work at your house. It would get it from the modem. And then um, EM1, this is that, that whole network of 192.168.1.1. And here's the, uh, 192.168.2.1 and everything uh, worked how we wanted it to if we want we can look at how all these all the um, interpolation from the variable to number it was all done and before the file was put in here um, uh, you know, we can see it it took all the variables and turned them into into configuration which and put it on the machine for us, which is great. Um, even even uh, I 
I mean, it even did these calculations like, what's the network? Um, what's the 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 biggest uh, the last no the last usable IP address? So it, that was cool that that we could just call those things out and get them like that, and just put them into a file. Um, and then I guess what there was a. Oh, what is it? Is it dot leases? Um, there is a leases file that you can check to see what all the uh, IP addresses that it gave out are. Um, but it's okay. I. I um, I'm not remembering exactly where it is right now. It's it might be right here. Yeah, I don't remember where it is, but it, it's okay. Um, it's somewhere. <laughs> Anyways, um, uh, var db dh. It in there. Well, um, oh yeah, dh client dot leases. Um, let's check out that real quick. And then if you just do cat, um, okay. So it looks like it. Um, yeah, fifty three. Three. Oh, these are the upstream ones. Oh, that's DH client. Uh, okay. Well, anyways, um, that's just showing the ones that are from my machine already. But they're. Um, it's okay. Um, we'll move on. Uh, don't want to get too into the weeds there. So basically, that's how we would create a router and everything. Um, now let's talk about the web app. So the web app is going to be a cloud VM running FreeBSD, and then it's going to have a Python web app with fast API, a PostgreSQL database server, and Nginx web server. So what is that all going to look like? Um, it's basically just going to look like this. It's going to be a big VM with everything in it. Um, so I typically do my VMs um, in DigitalOcean. Um, it looks like they recently changed how they do their machines so there's no more free bsd when you create a droplet you have to do this custom image thing and um, upload an actual like file from your hi uh, hypervisor file that you've already put cut free bsd on so anyways you would just go more start a droplet once you got one of these files and then uh, basic just do the cheapest one and um, this isn't going to matter because I don't, but we're just telling it that, you know, to make this interface happy um, because it's not going to automate any of this stuff for us. And we'll just hit create. Okay, so that's going to create a FreeBSD machine for us. And we're just trying to get that. Um, we want it, we want the domain globe api workshop .lab .bsd pw to point to that machine so what we're going to do is we're going to basically type exactly that globe api workshop um, oh i guess it looks like it's got um in this case, it's already in here. So we'll just do that. Make sure that it, it, it does end up being globe api workshop.lab.bsd.pw. And we'll redirect that to our droplet. Uh, and we'll make this number lower in case we need to do this again. And we'll just hit create. And so when I type lab, globe api workshop.lab.bsd.pw, it should redirect to uh, there. 
is what we would hope. Um, so let's go ahead and give that a shot. Um, what we want to do first, though, is since this isn't really set up yet, um, we actually have to go into this droplet and click on the console. Then they give us this little console guy. And in here, we can, we can log in. Um, and to log in, we're going to need to log in with the password. Um, Uh, let me grab that real quick. Yeah, okay. Anyways, um, let's go ahead and grab that. So... We just want to go into sudo, vi sudo here real quick and go to wheel. And we're just going to do this one for simplicity. You can set up your SSH however you feel comfortable. And that should be good. We should have our SSH running now. Let's go ahead and... Um, We'll have to do SSH copy ID to get our key up there. So let's um, let's do that. So let's grab this IP address and we're going to come here to web app and we're going to um, SSH copy ID of um, FreeBSD at that. We'll say yes. And it added. Okay, cool. And it looks like that 167 address is looking good. But um, let's see if we can SSH into the machine now. So SSH... Um, and we had globe api workshop lab okay so it looks like we were able to connect now that's good um so what do we do um we can run the ansible let's just double check so we have these different um, ways that you can run Ansible. Um, the start at task thing lets you start at a certain task. That's good for when you're developing the playbook. You can keep moving through different tasks until you get everything working. But basically, we'll, ru we'll run this playbook and then I'll show you what it does. Um, so we're doing Ansible playbook, two Vs, and we're doing ask vault pass. That's going to tell Ansible um, that there's an encrypted file which is called an Ansible vault, and we would like Ansible to decrypt that vault so that we can use the secrets in there. Um, the format looks exactly like the group bars all config, you know, just the, the key value pairs, but it's an encrypted file. So it just needs to be unencrypted if you're going to have that in your playbook. I use that for things like the database password and API keys for different services and things like that. And before we run that, let's hit Control D real quick. Control C, I mean. Let's double check hosts. 
And yeah, so the host that's going to connect to is the globe API workshop dot lab dot BST dot PW. Right. Okay. So we'll, we'll paste in our vault password there. And here it goes. It's doing the bootstrap Python. Um, I did not comment out the FreeBSD update on this one, so it is going to do the FreeBSD update and take a second in the background. Um, darn. I guess while it's doing that, I can show you um, up here. We'll, we'll start working on something else. Uh, let's go into that. Um, wait, which folder are we in? We're in um, okay, and and then we're in Ansible. Okay, so this is a um, a little bit bigger one. So we've got several different playbook files here at the top direct level. Um, some of them were for when I was working on the machine locally and other ones, you know, this is where I was just setting up the database with FreeBSD and the app server. And then this one had the web server and was actually deploying everything. Um, originally I was, had playbooks and tasks that I was building with, uh, virtual machines. And so those are still hanging around just like, so cause they had some interesting settings in them like this FreeBSD local one we can look at real quick and that'll kind of show you um, just a, a few differences if you're going to be controlling the same machine that you're running Ansible on. So um, what was it? App server local. So this one, you know, you had um, become method and you would just say su instead of sudo and the connection type is a uh, local so it wouldn't use ssh it would actually just uh, run the commands on the local machine so those are good when you want to override the default ssh connection method and, and the default sudo um, these will those two options will help you a lot um, and then another thing, if you are running these local command, uh, commands, the FreeBSD update one does have a, um, a different flag to it. Um, so I'll show you that one. Basically, they have this dash dash not running from cron. Um, so I guess when you're not going over SSH and you're having Ansible do its local connection type. Um, if you don't do this, you'll see uh, an error from FreeBSD update. Um, so you just do that. That'll solve that. Um, and it doesn't hurt anything if you leave it there for when you are installing over SSH. So I thought I'd just show you the two different ways there. Um, So this one is going to have um, the group bars all in the config, like the normal one, and then it also has secrets. And um, secrets are pretty, um, you just type Ansible vault, and you have edit, and then you can do group bars all secrets, or you have um, view, and then that group bars all secrets. Or if you haven't created that file yet, then you can just do create. Uh, group bars all secrets and then it'll ask you to like create well, create an encrypted file it'll ask you what's your encryption you know password or passphrase and you would just um, do that then and so that's kind of how you work with Ansible Vault to once the reason why I do my um, playbooks like this is because if you put the secrets file direct right here in this group bars all secrets then you don't have to you don't have to include it anywhere in your command line. So it's just an easier way to, to use secrets and Ansible faults without having to do extra flags 
you could just do Ansible playbook and the name of your playbook and you're good to go. Um, so let's take a look at the Ansible config. This one's doing inventory host. The remote user on, on the virtual machine is FreeBSD. Um, I didn't, I didn't do the, uh, the, uh, Python, uh, number of things. So it's just using 3.9 directly. It's not a variable in this playbook. Um, like I did in the router playbook that I was just showing you multiple ways that you can do things. Um, just ideas for you. Um, uh, so the, the, this one has the role of uh, app server. It has the app server is going to have like your Python app server stuff. Um, it's going to be using G Unicorn as the app server. And uh, interestingly enough, I so to make Python run as a FreeBSD service, um, you would just install it as an RC script. And typically, when these fast API um, programs are first ran, they do some initial configuration. And so I have a different RC script for GUnicorn when it initially runs, then I tell it to, you know, then I tell it to stop the service, then I replace the service file with this one, then I start the service again. And um, so yeah, we, we can look through those. So um, so yeah, if I was to go into roles, app server, um, templates, and then we have a G unicorn RC. So G unicorn, this is using a, um, an RC file. So it starts like this, bin sh, and it, you use these provide and require and before to kind of place it in the startup process and you give it a name and then command interpreter is how you tell uh, FreeBSD that this is a Python. Um, well, you, you tell it like what the scripting language is, the interpreter for the commands. So I'm just referencing my project directory inside of my virtual environment. And there's a Python binary in there. And uh, this is doing the same thing, but instead inside my virtual environment, there's going to be a G unicorn application. So it's just using dollar name to pull out G unicorn from up here. Um, proc name. That's just going to make sure that the process is called G unicorn in top and things like that. So you can see it. Um, this is going to give it a PID file and this is how you set flags. So I'm doing um, G Unicorn, but I want to do it with the, de the daemon, so it'll run in the background. Uh, I'm having it logged to a file. I'm having it, um, it's using the PID file value from up here. And um, it's going to use my username from my configuration uh, variables, the, the same group as the username. And then it's going to change into, it's going to make sure that it's running in the app application directory. And then it's going to do four workers and it's going to run, um, this API and the API has a function called main and a method called app. So, um, the only difference really between this this template in the initial one is the workers were just one in the initial one. Cause if you try and run f as four workers, it'll do the initial startup four times. And so the first time the initial startup will work, but then the other three, it'll fail on the other three. So if, if you just, if you just, um, do initial RC, I'll show you. This one has one worker. And so that'll, that'll just uh, do that once. And the way that I told it to do that kind of stuff was I went in here to, um, let's go into tasks. Um, let me show you, yeah. Uh, I guess I can show you the EMV template real quick. And then we'll go into tasks and we'll look at how I put these files into place. Um, 
So this is basically how it connects to the database. It's going to use PostgreSQL, PsychoPG2, and it needs the database user, it needs the database password, it needs the host, the port, the name. And the cool thing about this is these are in the config, this is in the secrets file. You don't have to like specify which file it's in. It'll, it'll look around and find all the variables and put them where they go. And we want SSL and you know, we need some auth tokens for different services like SendGrid for email and Twilio for SMS. We were using a text message thing um, so people could text in their, their information to, to Twilio. Twilio will call our API and save data to Postgres. That's kind of what this app was doing. Um, so yeah, now let's look at the tasks. And then we have app server set up. And so this task is going to do a, um, an interesting thing it does here is it installs Git. Uh, we're using Git Lite because that's the one that, um, so we're doing package, the name is Git Lite, state is present. This one is the, the lightweight version of Git. It's basically just the command line tools and not any of the graphical utilities or the um, network uh, server, I think, that it has, like a Git UI thing. Um, then it's, it's going to create a deploy directory, so it's just saying file um, path is this git deploy key and that's going to be a directory. Then we're going to copy our deploy key. So if you have a deploy key on GitHub because you're using a private repository and you want some server on the internet to be able to, to sync from that, you can put a key. So I have a key on my local machine that I want to copy over and then I have a um, on the destination, I want to put it in the in the user's home directory, and then get deploy key, and then save it as read only key, and that'll save it as zero six zero zero with my username, and that will make it so that um, when I run the the latest git command, so this is a, a module called git now, that I can give it a repo, and it will go to that repository it'll it'll save it into the direct the the project directory and it'll just do a git clone into the project directory folder and it'll use that key file and then um, this is how i set up a virtual environment um, so i just did shell and i just did what i normally do in, in python um, go into my project directory type python dash m vem and then the name of the virtual environment i just always call it vem and then go into that virtual environment and run pip install and, and that upgrades pip and setup tools and then this will install the requirements and that'll do all that'll get all the python packages downloaded and installed and then the copy env template into place this is just putting a file for my python web app to use so it has all the database connection information and, and the API keys and things like that. And then the initial worker. So this was the one worker for the app server. So I had template, the source was initial Gunicorn RC and the destination. If, if you put a RC file into user local Etsy RC dot D and then the name that you want, it will, um, you can treat it like a service. So you're able to either, you can either do the service and give it a name and say the state. You can also, you, you, you could, I could have also just said uh, enabled is true on service and that would have done this part. Um, or, or you can just sysrcg unicorn enable. But I, I did it on the shell like this because I also wanted to um, make the script executable. And uh, I figured I would just do it like that. Um, you can always just come in here and, and just add an extra line called enabled um, enabled and uh, true if you want it to do this part without sysrc. But sysrc is, is you can run that a bunch of times and it'll only make sure there's just one entry in there. So sysrc is already idempotent, just as a side note. Um, so I run Geonicorn, it does that initial setup or whatever that uh, FastAPI wants to do with, with the database and then it shuts it down. So you're just saying state started and then state stopped. And then I copy over the 
multi worker template, do the same thing, um, chmod plus x, and uh, then I start start the app with uh, start unicorn. So that will uh, just use the service module. It'll look for a service named gunicorn, which we just installed, and it will make sure it's started. And that'll make sure our app server's up and running. So that's pretty much all that the app server's doing. Um, we have uh, our database has got um, some interesting things going on here. And so does our web server. So we'll do database first and then we'll do web server. So database has um, these handlers are just going to be like, how do you restart Postgres if you needed to? And then um, let's look at Postgres setup. So Postgres setup, I need to install Postgres server. Um, so instead of putting name down here and then putting this in quotes, you can also do it on one line like this, name equals and no quotes. And then with items, that's just another way of doing that. And just be careful that you keep an eye on this psycho PG um, is one of its dependencies is a certain PostgreSQL client number. And if you're not running the right client, it will uninstall your server right after you just installed your server and it'll install like the, the other version. So if I was running Postgres server 12, it would install 12 server, which comes with client. And then this would get installed and it would uninstall 12 and it would install 13 because this needs 13 client. Um, yeah, so just make sure you keep an eye on those different dependencies like that. So I changed this to 13 and now that doesn't mess with this at all. Um, the uh, That's just, you know, the SQLite one, that's, that's just there for... Um, um, usually for the testing parts of my app. Um, so the auto start, um, we could have just done the system, the service enabled, but we can also just run sysrc. Um, so I just did sysrc for that. I did sysrc for this. Um, uh, this is just how you set up Postgres. Um, we're setting up a data set with ZFS create and the name of our database, uh, the name of our Z pool, and then we want PGSQL. We're setting a mount point as user local PGSQL, and we're doing the PGSQL data as a data set, and setting the owner for that. And then we initialize Postgres and with the one init DB, and that created some directories, and we're gonna move those directories out of the way because um, we want to create the data set. We want to modify the data set um, where these are going to go. And then we'll put all the files back. So we're just doing PGSQL data and then base. And then PGSQL data and uh, PG write ahead log, I believe is what WALL stands for. And um, we're using record size 8K because that's what uh, that's what was recommended. Um, so uh, then we set the the base data set to be owned by the user, and then the this data set to be owned by the user, and then we copy the contents from these old directories back across. And we could have used the copy command but um, we were using some specific flags here and I just did it like this, um, or the copy module. Um, then, then we wanted to clean up those old directories so you can just use file, give the destination of a, a directory and just say apps and it'll recursively delete everything, that directory and everything below it. It's like rm-rf, basically, it's like that. So that'll clean up both those old directories and then we start Postgres. So service PostgreSQL state started. And then this is gonna run PSQL and it's gonna create um, 
a role with password from the D from the DB password uh, secrets, and that's going to allow them to log in. And then we're we're using this PG pass file because that makes it easy to do stuff like this. Like if you want to create a database, you can just do the user and run the command and what database you want to run it on, database name, and it will uh, pick up the settings from this file to, to, to do the connection. And then um, this is just generating the SSL prompts, the answers to all those, and those come from variables. Um, that that's literally just from that. Um, there's there's a template file called uh, rec.conf, and we're just putting it here. Um, I could show you that in a minute. It's pretty straightforward. Um, then it's just using the open SSL command, and it's going to pull in that rec.conf, and here's a few uh, settings for open SSL. And then it'll make a key, and it'll make sure that all that's put into the right folders and then it will clean up that uh, temporary file it will change the uh, settings on this key file um, you can do that with file and then owner and mode that's an easy way to change the owner and the and the mode of the file and then here we have one that's pretty cool called block in file um, so let me show you basically before we go any further let's what's happened here we've had um um the website loaded so here's here's basically what our, our web apps on the internet it has its let's encrypt certificate um which the certificate was just generated and um, if we go to the docs you can see we're running fast API and here's our different endpoints we can post to uh, observer to create an observer um, we can post to measurements to send in a temperature and we can um, use a measurement, uh, create like a little web page using the measurement picture. Um, this will make a little picture, um, a little graphical um, web page that shows their measurement information from the database. Um, but basically, that's the app running. So that's good to see um, that it. You know, we got a whole application up and running on Python and FreeBSD and Let's Encrypt with Nginx and all that. Um, and it just did 57 commands. And we know that it's doing everything right because it does it the same way every time and makes it really simple to go through. And if one of these were to fail, like when, when I when I create these, if like Fell, um, write custom engine next configuration or something like that failed. I could just push up and type a um, start at task equals and then put the name of that task right there, write custom engine next configuration, and it'll start there and it'll just continue on until it, it something else happens. And if you wanted to be able to skip certain tasks because you didn't want to check them for whatever reason or, or you, you were still debugging something, you can use step. And that'll walk through one command at a time and say, would you like to do this? Yes, no, or um, continue. If you push continue, it'll just continue through the rest of the playbook. But if you say yes, it'll do it. If you say no, it'll skip it. So those are two different tricks, the start at task and the step are real helpful for when you're editing, um, when you're creating your playbook and you're making this all happen. Um, um, so let's let's keep looking. We were we were looking at um, um, 
yeah, what did we, oh, we had it over here, huh? Okay, I was like, where did we go? Um, so we were just looking at some of the different files that were created. Um, so we'll just make this a little bigger. Um, okay, so block and file, what did this one do? Block and file, uh, it went to the file called user local pgsql data postgresql.conf and it added this postgresql settings to it. Um, put the listen address, the port, and SSL equals on. Um, so if we've looked at that file, um, we just need to be SSH into the machine. Yeah, if you'll notice here, it says begin Ansible manage block at the end of this file. And then it and then it shows my PostgreSQL settings and has that listen address and everything. And then end manage block. So um, that's a good way to get multiple lines into a file, is a block in file. And then um, it just works like this. You, you, you put block, then you put a pipe and everything after that you indent a little bit, but everything after that, it just all just goes into the file, each of these lines. Um, so, so it's kind of like a template, but it, it, it's when you don't want to supply the whole file, you just want to supply like parts of it, the end of it maybe. Um, so this one would be, um, how do you, you know, this is another template. So there's a pghpa.conf. I'm just putting that into the user local Postgres QL data, um, pghpa.conf and making the, the owner and the group and then I'm restarting Postgres with these settings in place and now it's going to have the SSL and everything like it's supposed to. Um, so that, that's how we did the uh, the database. Um, we can look at some of those um, those files the um, template files I was talking about. So we had rec.conf this was just the distinguished name, prompt no, and then country name, state, locality, common name, and email. Those are usually the SSL questions you get asked. And then um, we had a PG pass. Um, this is just a format. If you have a file, a .pg pass file in your home directory, if you have this exact settings, then it'll it'll let the PSQL command pick up the the database connection. Real simple like that. Um, then uh, pghba.com. Let's look at that one. So this one is just saying um, it wants SSL on on any of the connections coming in. It's only going to connect over the local um, network. So that's how I have this set up. Is since the database is on the same machine as the app server and everything, I just have it set up like this. Um, okay, so let's um, look at the next one we have would be web server. Um, so let's look at how we did the web server. So we have uh, we have uh, templates nginx.conf. This is where we just said that who the user is, the worker processes, worker connections, and then um, this is where we said the app stream server port. So it's localhost, and then whatever the we're going to call this thing app app server. It says upstream app server. So that that means the connection is going to come in to the web server on either port 80 or 443. If it comes in on 80, it'll be redirected to the 443 one. And then it has this, these accept filters. These are FreeBSD things, uh, HTTP ready and data ready that you can do. I mean, there's some modules you can KLD load them to get those, which I'll show you. We have that in our playbook. And then uh, that's where it gets the server name. The FQDN is the server name. 
and then um, server tokens off. It's not going to tell you guys uh, people connecting like what the server numbers are or anything. Um, these are just some different settings for the SSL certificates and the um, where the static directory is. And here, here's where it is in my project. Um, it's if you want to run static files from the web server and not from your web app. Um, you can do it like that. And then if it's anything else, basically um, it will try to go to app server. So it kind of just kicks everything to app server. And app server is um, uses gzip on the connection and it passes over all the information from the person to your app so that your logs and everything make sense. And that's kind of all you have for Nginx there in, the, in that file. Um, because we also have the task Nginx. So what do we do here? We did, um, we needed Nginx and then pi38 certbot, that's what I'm using for Let's Encrypt. And then um, I just used SRC to turn on Nginx when the when the um, VM starts, and um, with this, I'm just turning on a um, a, a firewall, IPFW firewall. This is the, this is an easy way to do that. Is sysrc firewall enables yes, firewall types workstation, firewall my services, and you just give them like 22 TCP, 80 TCP, 443 TCP, and um, then allow services. And that's how I would set that up. Um, the directory structure I just did uh, for my web server is user local www and then the fully qualified domain name. And um, that, that's just a directory. And then so this is the let's encrypt command. So you just say certbot, cert only, standalone D, give it your fully qualified domain name. Uh, the M, you give it your email, and then you agree to service, and the N is like not going to bug you, it'll just do it. And so, yeah, that what this does is since we we enable, you know, we said to, when the computer starts to turn on Nginx, but we didn't actually um, turn it on yet because the cert bot is going to run its own Nginx, um, so it needs Nginx to be off right now. Because so when it runs this, it'll run Nginx for a second, it will get the certificate, save the file, and then it'll turn it off its own little server. That's what the standalone does. And then um, this will, this is those those modules I was talking about. You can KLD load them to ACCF data and ACCF HTTP. And then here's how you'd add those so you don't have to KLD load them every time you, you just put them into bootloader. And I'm just using block and file again to add two lines to bootloader.conf. And then um, here's my Nginx configuration. It's going to the template, nginx.conf, and it's putting it in the Etsy, user local Etsy nginx.conf. Then it's running the validate nginx command. That'll make sure the configuration looks good. And then it's going to create the DH param. Uh, directory and then I'll actually run that command to create that file then it'll start nginx and then I have this reboot freebsd at the end here and that was um, just to make sure everything comes up and I didn't miss anything um, so I just have it rebooted for good measure at the end just to make sure everything boots up like it's supposed to when it first turns on. But um, essentially, that's how these pieces go together. And that, that's why I like to show you how I built this playbook of having it in these different folders with the tasks and the handlers and everything kind of broken out like this because these things can get pretty big pretty quick. And it's nice to be able to uh, um, break them down into so that you can just say, you know, I want to work with these roles and start going through the tasks and running 
all the tests and pull in templates when you need them and use handlers to restart things when you need to. And then you have all, you know, full on services running as it or can be reproducible. Um, and that's how you would do that. So um, let's go back here. Okay. Uh, any questions? Feel free to ask. Um, uh, yeah, I'm on the the Zoom, and would love to answer your questions. Um, and I'd just like to thank this Damonology.net blog post. Um, a lot of good tips in the FreeBSD Edge Router Lite for setting up a router and how you would do that. And a lot of this configuration in this demo was was inspired directly from here. Um, the handbook of FreeBSD, you know, it's really good. You need to learn how to create startup scripts and uh, how different things work. It's always a good place to go. Um, the Ansible documentation, just learn how all these different modules work. Um, you, can, you can look through each of the modules and there's so much good information on each one and they have examples on how they work. And then uh, I took this tutorial at EuroBSDCon called Managing BSD Systems with Ansible with uh, Benedict. And that was or such a good tutorial and that really helped me um, finally just stop taking my notes and, and text files and actually using uh, Ansible playbooks to configure services and configure different things that took me a while to build up. And um, it's nice to have them in a, in a playbook so that you can you can share them around and uh, um, yeah, if, if, if that's all, um, thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm really happy to, to share this and um, I'm looking over here in my notes to see what the URL is for the uh, API workshop because I wanted to give you that um, um, yeah, let's give you that uh, that file for um, well, I'll uh, I guess I could just share it in the chat. Thank you so much, and uh, I'll share these files um, in the chat here on Zoom, and then I can also later add them um, to my website. I have a website of uh, bsd.pw, so. Uh, I'll put the slides up there uh, on the homepage as well um, once I got them. Um, thank you so much and have a great day.